God is with us, and the people say, here we find new life. Unfortunately, it seems this morning that our second camera is not working. Um, we, you could hear, I know, that Mark and Jim are here, and, and we can vouch for that. We promise you that they are, and hopefully as we go through the service, we'll get that, we'll get that going again. I'm Reverend Kevin Weichel, uh, joined by my senior colleague, the Reverend George Harris, of course, music director Mark Mercier, saxophonist Jim Martoccio, facilities manager Ardell McGee, and director of children's ministry Jessica Willannon, and our product production engineer Annie Petiti. Friends, as we gather for worship on this cold January morning, we hope that you are staying warm. We invite you to take advantage of the situation and grab a hot cup of coffee or a warm blanket and to know that wherever you are, whatever your age, whomever you love, whatever the color of your skin, whether your faith is full or in doubt, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Please join me in prayer. Spirit of God, come. Be with us this hour. Fill our hearts, open our minds, ignite our spirits. Make us mindful of your presence in our lives. Through our worship, may we hear your voice, recognize your call, and go forth ready and willing to follow where you lead. Amen. God's word for us. Let your hearts and spirits be open. God is our strength and our salvation. Wait patiently for the Lord. With willing hearts and spirits, we wait for the Lord. Amen.
The Gospel of Mark was the first gospel written. It's also the shortest in length and in detail. In Mark, there's no Christmas story, no Mary and Joseph, or angels and shepherds. We begin instead with John the Baptist, his camel hair clothes and leather belt wardrobe, and of course, his diet of locust and honey. John is inviting everyone, as this gospel opens up, to change their hearts and their lives, to be baptized. Not long after our introduction to John, Jesus enters the picture. He is baptized by John in the Jordan, of course, and then forced out into the wilderness, where for two verses and 40 days he is tempted by the devil. This morning's passage picks up with John's arrest and the start of Jesus' public ministry. Hear these words from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and trust the good news. As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said. I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets, and they followed him. After going a little farther, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat, repairing and mending their fishing nets. At that very moment, he called to them, and they followed him too, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. These are holy words. Thanks be to God. did not have my microphone on, so I will begin again. (laughs) So I started by asking, and I'll start again by asking, if you can picture in your mind's eye Simon and Andrew, fishermen, casting their nets into the sea, pulling their nets back in over and over again, casting and pulling, casting and pulling, A little farther down the shoreline, Zebedee's sons are there, James and John, and they are meticulously mending and repairing their nets. According to Alicia J. Batten, associate professor at the University of Waterloo and author of Fishing Economy in the Sea of Galilee, most fishing families were poor. They lived at a subsistence level, while a small minority of elites held the bulk of wealth 
and power. Peasant fishermen had little to no control over fishing's license fees, tax, or toll rates. It's reasonable to conclude that such an economic situation was one of exploitation. It probably also intensified in the Galilee during the reign of Herod Antipas due to his increased commercialization of fishing and his own self-indulgent living. And so there they were, Simon and Andrew, James and John, doing the laborious and monotonous work of casting and pulling and mending their nets. No opportunities for promotion or upward mobility in sight. Like their fathers, this is what they were going to be doing every day for the rest of their lives. Reminds me a bit of that old Dunkin' Donuts commercial with the baker getting up at 3 a.m. saying, gotta make the donuts, gotta make the donuts. It is in this busy monotony of casting and pulling and mending that Jesus comes along saying, repent, trust the good news. Now, I'd be willing to bet that not many of us fish for a living. But I think we know something about casting and pulling and mending. Like Andrew and Simon, James and John, day after day, we do our thing, often on autopilot, expecting nothing or little to change. We cast, pull, and mend to make a living, to feed our family, to pay the bills. We cast, we pull, and we mend to gain security, to be able to send our kids off to college, to have enough for retirement. We cast, pull, and mend through our workday, trimming down the email inbox. We cast, pull, and mend through our school day, completing assignment after assignment. We cast and we pull to hold our families together, to make our marriages work. This past year, we've been casting and pulling and mending, trying to manage lives impacted by COVID-19, consumed with so much grief and sickness and loneliness, financial stress. We casted and we pulled and we mended through a toxic election season, an attempted coup at our capital, and a continued cold civil war, as Princeton professor Eddie Glaude Jr. has labeled the climate and the tension in our country. Casting, pulling, and mending are the realities of our lives. There are also the circumstances in which Jesus comes to us, the context to which we hear the call to new life. Jesus has a way of showing up in the casting, pulling, and mending. That's what he did for Simon and Andrew, James and John, and that's what he does for you and me. When over the past week I was looking closely at this morning's text, the word repent stuck out to me. The Greek word for repent is metanoia, and I've most often seen it translated to mean turn around. I learned this week, however, that a more accurate translation of metanoia may be to be of a new heart and mind. In other words, in asking these men to repent, Jesus is presenting them with more than a task or a job. He is inviting them to reorient their hearts and their minds and their lives towards God's purposes. For them, this means leaving their boats and following Jesus on the spot. Repentance, reorientation entails personal change for sure. But as these fishermen would eventually find out, personal change also has public implications. To put it another way, we cannot reorient our hearts and minds toward the purposes of God without bringing along God's vision for love and justice. The call to repent entails personal consciousness raising. Personal consciousness raising. The call to fish for people is Jesus' invitation for these fishermen to help Jesus bring others along into this endeavor. Perhaps the word repent stuck out to me so much in this reading because lately I've been thinking a lot about how we as Christians haven't always been the best fishers. We haven't always been the best advocates for the message of Jesus. We are so imperfect. Because of this, American Christianity must be evaluated when it comes to our ability to retreat from this cold civil war we are experiencing. And I think we need to repent 
and reorient. The hard truth is that as a result of the Christian gospel often being harmonized with the American dream, we not only have a COVID pandemic, but also a Christian nationalism pandemic. Let me define what I mean by Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civil life. At first glance, we may think this is a good thing. I spent my late teens and early 20s believing that was the case. What I have come to see, however, is that when Christianity is married to the state, Jesus loses credibility and impact. When Jesus is identified too closely with a political party, any political party, he is used for cover as a kind of mascot to justify and even advocate for the types of issues, policies, and candidates that often end up looking nothing like Jesus. We may say God is more important than country, but it really ends up so that country or political party is wagging the dog. In the book, Taking America Back for God, Christian Nationalism in the United States, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry call data from Americans all around the country. They find that those with a Christian nationalist mindset are more likely to approve of authoritarian tactics, like demanding people to show respect for national symbols and traditions. Fear and distrust religious minorities, including Muslims, atheists, and Jewish people. Condone police violence towards black Americans and distrust accounts of racial inequality in the criminal justice system. Believe racial inequality is due to the personal shortcomings of minority groups report being very uncomfortable with both interracial marriage and transracial adoption, hold anti-immigrant views, fear refugees, believe lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning people are an abomination to God, oppose scientists and science education in schools, believe that men are better suited for all leadership roles while women are better suited for care for children and the home. Of course, Jesus was a brown-skinned Middle Eastern man who saw potential in lowly fishermen. He saw God in Jews and Samaritans, women and men, the tax collector and the poor, the prostitute and the leper. While I am certain God sees potential in everyone who has a Christian nationalist mindset, I am also certain that the concept of Christian nationalism does not aligned with the mission and the ministry of Jesus. In the year 325, Constantine at the Council of Nicaea sanctioned Christianity as a legitimate religion within the Roman Empire. The council worked to solidify the church's core theology to which Christians had to subscribe if they were to hold the true faith. Pastor and author Brian Zond said of the Council of Nicaea, Christianity became a chaplain serving the interests of the empire, which watered Christianity down and made it unable to speak to the issues of the day. Over time, Jesus was co-opted to serve a political agenda and became relegated to the Secretary of Afterlife Affairs. The question, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, became the question instead of, are we creating a loving and just world for all? Friends, we need to repent and reorient as American Christians. Scholar Walter Brueggemann says our faith calls us every day to be deciding between the narrative of scarcity, fear, greed, and violence, or the narrative of abundance, courage, generosity, and peaceableness. Every day, Christians must remake that decision because the dominant story is so powerful that it continues to seduce us all of the time. This past Friday, news broke that Hank Aaron died. As a baseball fan, the news stopped me in my tracks. As most of you know, Hammer and Hank broke Babe Ruth's home run record in the 1970s. I wasn't around when it happened, but I've seen replays of that iconic home run. And I knew of his incredible talent, 755 career home runs and a 305 batting average. Just incredible. After Aaron's passing on Friday, 
I began reading some more about him. And I saw an interview about a time Aaron was asked if he enjoyed the home run chase. He replied that he doesn't like to think about it, that he'd rather think about other things. It was clear that Hank Aaron didn't enjoy that home run chase at all. He just wanted it to be over with. He received so much hate mail and so many death threats because he was chasing a white man's record that he couldn't stay in the same hotel as his teammates. In the hotel in which he did stay, he had to officially be assigned to one room while he stayed in another. Teammate Dusty Baker shared a story about a day when Aaron told him not to sit next to him on the bench because he was given specific information that a man in a red jacket might shoot him. In 2014, on the 40th anniversary of Hank's 715th home run, when he finally passed Babe Ruth, he was interviewed. After being asked to comment on a piece of hate mail he received decades ago, he was asked about the current state of race relations in the United States. This is what he said. The difference is that back then they had hoods. Now they don't wear hoods, and a lot of them are in Washington with neckties and starch shirts. The outcry in Atlanta was enormous, and I'm sure many of those who were upset will consider themselves Christian. But friends, being a Christian nationalist is getting angrier at somebody for calling out racism than at racism itself. Discounting the stories of people of color or people in marginalized groups is not Christian. It would be like Jesus discounting the Samaritan woman at the well. Christians must take special care to listen with empathy, especially to those who have been ridiculed because of the color of their skin. As I come to a close, I recognize that the message of repentance and reorientation, especially when it comes to our thoughts about God and country, is hard emotional work. So I want to end by highlighting something I find quite comforting about this passage. When Jesus calls the fishermen in this morning's passage, he does not say the kingdom of God will come. He says that the kingdom of God, in fact, has come near. As Americans, we can and should be patriotic citizens. As Christians, we identify as members of God's kingdom, where not Caesar or any president or political figure from any party, but God's love and justice reign supreme. Friends, God is calling us in the castings and pullings and mendings of our lives to repent, to reorient our hearts and our minds. Let's make it so. Church. It's time to 
enter into a time of prayer together, a time to join our hearts, even as we are separated in distance, we can be one in the Spirit, one in Christ, uh, one through this body of Christ, the Church. I have a number of prayers to lift up this morning, and I would remind you that as you are watching on Facebook, you may enter your prayers into the comment section, and uh, Rev. Kev and I, we pay attention to those and uh, join you in praying for all those in your life or yourself who need prayers this morning. Now, first, some joys and celebrations to share. Uh, first, this evening, our junior fellowship, JF, our younger youth, will be making 480 sandwiches to give to three shelters that need food uh, in these times. And I understand there's over 20 people who are signed up already to make sandwiches. I think that's a Zoom exercise, sandwich making on Zoom. It's a thing. So uh, very, very excited about that, celebrating uh, all those who are stepping forward to be part of that ministry. Also, to celebrate, we are experiencing something of a baby boom here at First Church. Uh, a number of folks are expecting, uh, a number of women are expecting, and families are expecting. So among those, Sarah Gaines, who is expecting a baby in May, Kelsey and Ryan Beach in July, and also expecting in July, Brandon and Jillian Bassetta Hansen, uh, expecting a a child and their son Brady expecting a baby sister also in July. So how great is that? That is just uh, truly a joy to announce and share together. Uh, certainly a number of folks needing strength and healing in this time. Uh, Carol Folks, uh, that's brother-in-law to Cynthia Yosik, uh, is beginning some treatment for cancer. Herb Salch, we continue to pray for his recovery following a fall. Uh, also, with the Hansen family, praying for Brandon Hansen and the entire Hansen family on the passing of his mother, Susan. And Jane Wright, uh, we pray for her following the passing of her husband of 72 and a half years, Hal. Uh, certainly both longtime members here, and uh, I know, Jane, we grieve with you following the passing of Hal this past week. Also, the family of Patricia Estel, uh, following her passing. You know, she was a member of St. Mary's, but her husband, Frank, was a member here for many, many years. In fact, we have a tree in our courtyard here that was given in his memory uh, over 20 years ago. We continue to pray for Bill White and Susan Babcock White as they continue to face a number of challenges in their lives. And we pray for uh, family and friends of 17-year-old Dylan Pekloski, uh, who took his own life on January 6th. He was a childhood friend of our Andrew Fleming. And finally, we pray for uh, protection and support of the leadership of this country. We pray for this country in, uh, in all the challenges we are facing in this time. Uh, we pray for unity and justice and hold those two together. So again, uh, if you have prayers that you would like to add to those, I invite you to put them in the Facebook comments at this time. Uh, if you would like prayers listed in our weekly email or, or announced here on Sunday morning, please follow up this week with uh, Rev Kev or myself or the church office. Uh, after a moment of silence, we will, we will pray. Mark writes, now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the realm of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Well, God, as we have heard, there is a lot here in these two short verses. John the Baptist is arrested, meaning the world is not safe for those who commit to follow you. There is good news, and it is available to us here and now, which means there is no time to mess around. Jesus calls us to act now. 
repent, which means we need to tell the truth about ourselves and about the injustice of the world we live in. Believe. This means to trust in you, God, not to make everything better, but to lead and accompany us when we step out in faith to face the unknown. Facing danger, not messing around, repenting and trusting in you. The four men in this morning's story dropped their nets, giving up their livelihood, and followed you as made known to them and to us in Jesus. So God, we often appeal to you to open our eyes to see and our ears to hear you, and you do. We pray for you to intercede in our lives, to comfort us, strengthen us, heal us and help us, and you do. God, we have lifted up our prayers to you this morning and we entrust these into your care. But we seldom in our prayers, God, in these conversations with you, talk about what is required of us. Simon, Andrew, James, and John left their full-time jobs and their family to face an uncertain and dangerous future and follow you. Following you became their full-time job. They didn't look up to the sky and appeal to you for help. They just did it, and it changed their lives and changed the world forever. God, we and our world need that kind of change, need that good news to break through now, right now. What might that look like for us, God? What do you require of us? Assuming for the moment that we are not going to walk away from our means of supporting ourselves and our family, what might it look like to commit ourselves wholly to you? Because we live in dangerous times, and the time is now to step out in faith and give it our all. You need us. The world needs us. A young prophet and poet of yours, Amanda Gorman, spoke your truth at the inauguration. There is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. Indeed, God, open our eyes to see your light, and even more importantly, give us courage to drop everything, including our own comfort and safety, to be your light. May we love, support, and challenge one another as your church to be your light. We pray these things, and we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. great God of heaven and earth. You call us to leave behind our preoccupations and to follow you into the future. Sometimes we find your call challenging. We are comfortable, maybe even complacent in our present. May this act of giving be a gesture of our willingness to follow where you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this moment in our worship, we are invited to make our offering. Please click on the link in the comments below or by donating through the link on our website. Now let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. This is the day. This is the day that our God has made, that our God has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that our God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that our God has made. This is the day, this is the day Jesus.
Jesus rose again, Jesus rose again. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day Jesus rose again. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day Jesus rose again. This is the day, this is the day when the Spirit came, when the Spirit came. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day when the Spirit we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day when the Spirit came. That was Paris Albrecht and Aaron Harris singing. Big thanks to Mark for mixing that together and putting the arrangement together. Uh, for our, our music this morning. Wonderful. Thank you. Let's join together in our benediction. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. May God bless and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>